We have begun. Yes. Welcome, everyone. We are, we are <laughs> delighted, completely delighted to be having this gathering this, well, here in New Mexico, it's this morning, and it's many different times around the world, and to be gathering to look at with the eyes of very wise and seasoned anthropologists and open dialogue titians and students and teachers of open dialogue. And many of you are in the, um, are attending. I wish we were all together in person in a great big, huge circle, but we are in this network um, together. And particularly and grateful and thankful for all of the panelists, for, for um, Chiara and Eric, Anrik and David and Mark and Lauren, who've agreed to be our panelists this morning and for the reflecting team, Sabina and Werner and Onund. Um, Rafaela is in the chat today uh, and we're grateful, very grateful for you and Hope and Dialogue as being co-sponsors of the town hall and Shauna O'Callaghan as well representing as executive director of Open Excellence. So grateful to Madden America also for hosting this, this event. Um, I'm Louisa Putnam. I am an Open Dialogue practitioner and um, I'm also a family member of a beautiful, um, my beautiful son, Lucas, who um, made the journey through the psychiatric system and ended up um, taking his life. And that inspired me to be doing the work that I'm doing to, to have there be other ways of brilliant, wonderful young people um, who become psychotic, reclaiming their lives, which open dialogue is, as we all know, um, very capable of doing. Do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, uh, I'm Kermit Cole. Uh, I was um, one of the founding members of, of Mad in America, the Mad in America website, uh, of which I'm uh, truly proud. Um, and um, also do practice with Louisa Open Dialogue and uh, seek to bring training to the world uh, in the way, whatever ways we can uh, learn to do that. And I'd like to say that what's there's something different about this space that we are trying to create here today and in these this sequence of meetings, which is that we don't try to fill the space. We don't try to, you know, Louise and I do not drive the conversation. Uh, we try to create an open space in the spirit of, um, you know, dialogical sessions, open dialogue meetings, uh, in which people can feel safe to really explore what they're trying to say, uh, how they feel about what they have found themselves saying um, and leave space in between speaking to allow that to you know deepen and and then you know, uh, produce the next thing and then, and then um, so what that means is you know as you may hear a lot of silence ironically um, you may you may uh, and that's not um, that's not an accident that's not that's not that's a that's a, a feature not a bug it's an invitation. System. Yeah, and in that space and time, uh, those in the chat sessions, so in the chat room, uh, will you know interact and talk, and so we're all free to really speak when we can look deep inside and find the right next thing to say, rather than be in a kind of a, a race to be the next one to speak. Mm -hmm. So it's a very different kind of space. Uh, one of the consequences of that is that we haven't found a way to do that do these things and also fully integrate the conversation in the chat room with uh, the, the dialogue that we're witnessing and reflecting upon, um, which I know is frustrating for some people that we can't bring people, you know, that, that it's not really- Bring in that, people's faces. In. Yeah, it's not in that sense, this isn't truly a, a town hall as such, um, but uh, it is in the, in the way, and I think that it's a town hall in that, Everybody who comes gets to speak in some way, uh, whether it's in the chat room and, uh, or whether it's in the, the central dialogue. But 
And we do, to the extent that we're able, try to bring thoughts and feelings and reflections and questions from the chat room to the panel. Um, but uh, but we just we just haven't found a way to really integrate all of that and still accomplish the kind of space we're trying to create. Now, Kathy, someone's asking if there's an administrator in the chat room. Did you see that chat? Went by just Kathy. Uh, is I, I, per, Kathy and Raphael are are go ahead. Yeah, I wonder if Karen is more the person to be doing that, or whether it's actually the person the people and their own settings, because we can see each other each in, in the boxes, can't we? But somebody yeah. can't, they can only see, I think, Kermit's fate. They're only seeing this. What's... Uh, it, are the attendees only seeing Kermit's cartoon? Rafaela, do you, yeah. do you see everyone? Yes. Okay. Yes. People are not seeing people are not in people's faces. Karen, can you help with that? That maybe each person's individual oh, setting. Oh, some people can. I believe. Oh, some. Okay. Jane may uh, two things. I believe Jane may be on um the uh, this uh, come up in the chat. Might be on an iPad or an iPhone. Oh, okay. Yeah, if you can. If yeah, you, if you put it on gallery view, everyone, then you'll see the full panel. Hello, Tara. But also, if you go into the more and go to the webinar settings, there's a choice for whether it shows non-video panelists or not. And so you want to unclick that so that it does not show people who are not using their camera. I'm logged in in two places. One of them I'm using the camera, one of them I'm not, um, so that I can monitor the chat and do things like that. Um, so. Okay, so it, it might also be possible to, it might be different at the live stream on Facebook, so uh, I'll, I'll post that uh, here as well if people want to try that. Yeah. Um, okay. Karen, are we, are we good? Yeah, I just think the question about integration was more about bringing questions from the chat to the panel. Um, yeah. So, so um, that I think is, is the integration. Um, okay. Yeah. So there is a Q&A that people can put questions in. We don't generally have a lot of time for them, but you're welcome to put them there and they'll be brought to the panel if we can. Um, also wanted to say that um, for those that have just come on, that we're, there are six people on the panel and then we have three people that are reflecting. Um, Sabine and Werner and Onun are will be reflecting. So the panel will start with a conversation. We'll start by introducing themselves. We're so um, delighted and full of respect that for each of for each of you, um, those of you that are on the um, attending and those that are on the panel and reflecting, and the helpers. So please know that and. Um, we'll start with the panelists introducing themselves and the reflecting team also, and then uh, the reflecting team will turn off their cameras and just the panel will speak to each other. And then at a certain point, Kermit and I will ask the panel, the reflecting team to come forward and the panelists will turn off their cameras. And that will happen probably about two times. And um, and we'll direct questions if we can while the panelists are speaking. I hope that's making sense. And so let us begin. Kermit and I are going to um, be quiet now. And if you dear panelists and reflecting team will introduce yourselves, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Onun, I think you're first man up. Uh, shall I start? Okay, my name is uh, Onun Brotveit. Uh, I have a PhD uh, done on um, 
experiences with uh, open dialogue in Norway uh, in two, uh, uh, well, within mental health care uh, in two different uh, geographical areas. I have also uh, earlier made a field work in Italy on the Basaglian uh, reform of psychiatry there. And uh, for the time being, I'm working at the institute uh, which is doing uh, research on religion. And uh, my um, uh, interest now is on interreligious dialogue, uh, which is what uh, a topic I can work on uh, within my uh, current position. Okay. Um, hello, my name is David Moss and I'm an open dialogue practitioner in uh, North London Community Mental Health team as part of the National Health Service in the UK. Um, a, a team that is implementing a, um, an open dialogue trial. Um, and I'm also an anthropologist, a professor of anthropology at SOAS at the University of London. And I bring these two roles together in leading um, a, an anthropological study of open dialogue, which is running alongside the large randomized controlled trial, which is going on in the UK. And um, um, this, is, uh, this is a three year project and we're fairly early on in, in that project. And I'm speaking now, as, the, as you can see from London. Thank you, David. Uh, I'm Enrique Garcia, I'm a researcher at the Medical, uh, Medical Anthropology Research Center in Tarragona. I'm working in the implementation of open dialogue here in Spain. I just finished last year the foundation course, now I'm progressing to the further levels, and also I'm co-coordinating a, a postgraduate course here in, in Barcelona, on open dialogue one with Berta Valle and Jaco Secula. Thank you, Enrique. Thank you for coming. Hi, I'm Cassie. I'm a family therapist and an open dialogue trainer in the UK. And I'm uh, one of the chat people today along with Raffaella. And I just want to thank Ray very much for all the help she's given me to, uh, to do this. Um, and really just to sort of emphasize the collective wisdom in, in, in the whole of this group that are meeting today. So please do put your comments and respond to people in the chat. And also if you see questions, please do, please do, uh, and you feel moved to, to respond to them, please do put, put your responses in the, in the uh, Q&A section because uh, the, the panel won't be able to see much of or respond to your your questions specifically. So uh, just uh, just connect as you feel as you feel fit here. Um, and if you don't like the the chats sort of popping up, if you find that distracting, I can post something about how to switch that off on Zoom so you don't get uh, chat messages uh, coming up. If that's helpful, uh, good to be here. Thanks, everyone. Mm, thank you so much, Kathy. I love your language, connective wisdom. Hi there, I'm, I'm Karen Gerbert. Um, I work for Men in America, but I'm an artist and a writer and also identify as a psychiatric survivor. Um, I'm your person for tech questions. So if you have anything, having trouble or anything like that, please do um, shoot me a message in the chat and I'll make sure to keep an eye on those. Um, lovely to be here, and that's it. Thank you, Karen, so much. Hello, everyone. It's lovely to be here. Uh, my name is Kiara Vikramasinghe. I'm based in London, UK. Um, I'm a peer. I'm an anthropologist affiliated with the project that David Moss has just mentioned. I'm currently doing a PhD in anthropology. And I'm in my field work year, which is the second year of my PhD. So I'm based in a community mental health team in London, in North London, practicing open dialogue and being a researcher as well. Mm. Thank you, Kira. Kira and I and David are fellow students. 
of Mark and Kathy that we've got. Yay, thank you. Um, okay, I think I'm next. Hello everyone, I am Lauren Cabellis. I am an anthropologist. I did my doctoral research on open dialogue and crisis care in Germany. Prior to that, I worked with the research team on the Parachute Project in New York with the implementation of peer support and open dialogue in New York City. I currently reside in Berlin, where I am presently a postdoc at the Freie Universität in Berlin. And yes, very happy to be here. Mm, thank you so much, Lauren. Thank you, Lauren. Welcome, everybody, uh, all of you who are joining us. My name is Mark. Uh, I've had the privilege of, of teaching and researching open dialogue for about the past 15 years. I'm an assistant professor at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, but spend a, a lot of my time uh, here in the UK and in Oxford and part of the Odessi team and teach peer-supported open dialogue together with uh, Kathy and a wonderful group of of, of trainers. Uh, I also teach mindfulness, which we're also integrating into important aspect of, of, of uh, open dialogue. And it's wonderful to be here. Thank you. Happy to be together again. Rafaela. Okay, my name is Sabine. I'm from Germany. I've been working as a psychiatrist and for many, many years. Uh, when I then came to know to the open dialogue approach and started the last years of my professional life at a, a hospital in Berlin, trying to implement as much elements of the open dialogue as approach as possible into the daily work there. And I resigned from the hospital three years ago. And now when I'm working, I'm working as an open dialogue trainer. And I feel really honored to be asked by Luisa and Kermit to be part of this very nice meeting today. Thank you, Sam. Will it be Joanna or me? Okay, I, I will. Uh, so I will uh, yes. talk about, about me. Uh, I'm Werner. Uh, I'm living close to Hamburg in Germany. Um, I'm a retired psychiatrist. And well, uh, I <laughs> uh, had the, the great chance and the kind of a blessing to be able to introduce and implement open dialogue during the last seven years of my practical career into our hospital. And I draw a lot from that still. And now I'm into teaching open dialogue in different uh, ways and countries. And well, as I'm getting older, I feel also more and more as an observer. And this is why I like to be in the uh, reflecting team now to uh, get some, to listen to uh, what the ideas are about uh, the topic we're, we're talking about. Thank you. Okay. Oh, thank you so much, Werner. We had the joy of having Werner come and do it a year long training uh, intermittently here in Santa Fe. It was a big, a big gift to us. Um, thank you all. We're very, so happy and so now that you are all here and we are all together. And now Werner and Sabine and Onun, if you could, and Karen, if you could uh, turn off your um, videos, that would be great. And Kathy. We turn off pause. Yeah.
Thank you. We, um, the, the team that I um, involved with is uh, doing an anthropo the anthropological study of um, open dialogue, peer supported open dialogue in North London. We gave a, um, a, uh, a, a short um, workshop in the Hope and Dialogue conference. And we started that conference presentation by asking people in the virtual audience who we couldn't see. So it's quite difficult to, to judge what they thought anthropology was. What did anthropology bring to mind? And we wanted to sort of sense where, what do people think? What is anthropology? Why are we, why are we here? What, who are we? And um, in the chat, various things came back, um, groups, um, and, and the word culture came, came in. Um, anthropology is something about culture. And I suppose I'm thinking about that in terms of open dialogue and um, even in preparing for this um, town hall, I think Kermis or Louise had said, are we going to talk about open dialogue and, and culture and other cultures? And I think my first response to that or my initial response to that was, actually, I'm trying to understand the culture of mental health care in the UK. What's the culture of psychiatry? What's the culture of publicly, uh, the publicly funded healthcare system that I'm in at the moment? And I suppose one of our tasks as an, as an, as an, as an anthropologist is to try and ask that question, which involves sort of standing back and saying, well, what kind of culture are we in? And what does it mean to even up to ask that question about the culture of psychiatric organizations or mental health care systems? Yeah, I was taking a look at the comments that are streaming now from the audience. Um, Michael Hoffman just said, sorry, if I'm not if supposed to say names, just that the dialogue started with Socrates and we, I also think that the taste of Hamburg is still in our mouths, that there are things in that this culture that uh, maybe even in a theological way are out of limits. So this is something that psychiatry is just imposing these limits. Uh, treating people that are suffering, obviously, but also saying what is normal, what is not. So as anthropologists, I think that this is the long view that we can have other cultures, obviously. Uh, my background is uh, in an evolutionary anthropology. I come from, well, uh, traveling around, studying different fields. Uh, I stumbled upon philosophy, neuroscience. So basically, I have been through many of the cognitive sciences, and I just focus on anthropology. Uh, and yeah, I see that, that cultural, you, we can and we should focus on why the culture is behaving like it is, our, our own. And also, uh, we can bring the support of the hard sciences, supporting that dialogue, understanding, listening to each other. Is, it makes people feel better. It's what they need to heal. So this is something that anthropologists, biological anthropology can bring to the table as well in my opinion. I'm thinking about how anthropology would generally study a tribe and how in, in or a culture and how in this case we're studying the tribe of open dialogue. Um, but I also think of all these like other sub-tribes that I'm part of. So like the anthropologists training as open dialogue practitioners and with David and I and our team have become embedded in this pod team, a peer supported open dialogue team, um, trying to see what, what this open dialogue tribe is, is like. But then we are our own sort of anthropology tribe as well, doing something quite unique that hasn't really been done before. 
Um, and then doing the, the peer supported open dialogue training, um, I met, I was so fortunate to meet lots of other peers. And then um, something one of the peer support workers said on the training was, we are our own tribe as well. So, and it, it you really do feel part of that that tribe and it was such a sort of privilege to feel part of that as well. So I'm thinking about the, the complex picture that, you know, all these, all these little tribes I'm belonging to and kind of becoming a part of and observing as I go along. Thank you, Kiara. I, I, I love the idea of, of, of tribe um, as something that we've lost, um, as, as that sense of belonging and, and, and community. Um, and it reminds me of uh, a wonderful person, Carolyn Atneve, who was actually born the 2nd of July, uh, 1920. So she would have been uh, 101 years old today. Um, she was a First Nations uh, member of the Dakota tribe. And she, together with Ross Speck, uh, helped develop social network therapy. And we also know that social network is a concept originally coming from, coming from anthropology. And what she, her work as a psychologist and a social worker was to help First Nations people that had been through genocide in the United States and put on reservations. And she said, what we need to do is get back to our traditional tribal ways of collective healing. So retribalization became an important part of social network therapy for her. Um, and, I, and I always come back to, to, to thinking about open dialogue as actually returning to some sense of human connection that for some reason or for many reasons in our society, uh, we have lost. So restoring some, a culture of community and compassion and connection, I think is, is, is what we're trying to do because I don't think that is always present in traditional mental health care services today. I find myself still thinking about David's sort of opening question. Um, with regards to what it is anthropologists do and what it is the sort of objective of cultural study is. And one of the things that I have spent a lot of time thinking about in the different contexts in which I've worked with open dialogue is not just, not just the, the culture of the sort of local mental health system, but also open dialogue as its own sort of cultural framework. And Kiara also said something to this end, but what's interesting for me is where those where those meet and sort of what are the the frictions and the adaptations and the changes that are born of these two things coming into contact because one cannot be sort of inserted wholesale into the other there's always going to be adjustment and so what has been thought provoking for me as an anthropologist is is what is the melding? What is the sort of, what are the important contact points? What are the responses um, and adjustments that are made when a culture like open dialogue tries to negotiate or find a space within a different kind of mental health culture, whatever that may be. Um, and so this, there's this dynamic that for me is kind of an important focus when we ask these questions. Being a, um, a, part, a member of a community mental health team implementing open dialogue, that is, is part of the, um, that, that tension is part of the everyday experience. And I'm, I'm sure we'll come back to this in terms of talking about um, the question of implementation or, or the, um, what, what it means to um, for open dialogue as a, as a culture, as a community to, 
to reproduce itself? What are the conditions, institutional conditions, the political conditions, and other things necessary um, for that to for that for that to happen? What are the supports that that open dialogue needs? But I think before getting to that, I just just sticking with the the anthropology role because I think why I think as uh, being an anthropologist in answering that kind of question is important is because it's by it's by what what, what I understand anthropology to be doing is understanding a problem a, a phenomena uh, an issue an experience attention by being a part of it by experiencing its unfolding um, feeling that tension, maybe even feeling that tension, or definitely feeling that tension viscerally, um, so that our methods are not about surveys and questionnaires and focus groups or experimental designs or research protocols, but really the, ourselves and our subjectivity, our own subjectivity, um, and our own capacities to be engaging in whatever it is that the situation we're in um, in order to try and make, make sense of and reflect on that. So I think, Lauren, you're absolutely right. That is, that's, that's the heart of it. And I suppose I'm just saying, how do we, how do we come to understand that, um, that contact, those contact points? And I suppose I'm saying putting a flag up for the distinctiveness of a of an anthropological response to that question. I want to just mention that anthropologists, we are also able to be participants, like observers and participants in the biological labs. That's my experience doing the kind of research because we are the biological side of anthropology that it's just, it's there uh, physical and biological to study of human as a world also includes that and we do that anthropologists sometimes we split and there is only ones that do the one thing the others are not what i say is that having the chance of being in a lab and observing the the prejudices that are creating the psychiatric system that we live in that the individual is the one that has the problem. It's genetic in, in nature, etc. This is like the, the fundamentals of the approaches that ensure later that follow pills, the isolation in the, in the world, etc. When the research shows, and we are aware of that, that the social determinants, the isolation, the lack of community, the poverty also, all these things are there and they know, I mean, it is known. It just you have to put the the, the pieces together and say why the, the the power is only in the biological and why we cannot see the whole picture and act on the things that really are going to change and take the root of the problem out. So anthropologists are in a very privileged position in the sense that we can observe everything, we can participate, we can see and study humanity. Even if you are humans, we are here observing and try to at least do something. Yeah, thank you both. And, and, and thank you, David and, and, and Norman and Nick. The, the, uh, the idea of anthropology as, as, as a reflective, ref, reflecting, recursive process in the indigenous anthropologist and, 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 and that, that balance between stepping out and stepping in, um, I think is fascinating, especially because I, I do think that's one of the unique aspects of, of anthropology. And I wonder if there's a symmetry be uh, those of you who are both open dialogue practitioners and anthropologists, is there a symmetry between the experiential near, the, the, the deep understanding and the thick description of, of anthropology and, um, and that uh, same aspect of living with and being present um, with another person in another network, because that is fundamental to, to open dialogue. It's, it's not individual to individual. It's not even person to family. It's, it's team to person within layers and layers of social and cultural context. And so it was just your, your reflections on um, 
the similarities and symmetries between the anthropologist and the open dialogue practitioner? That's a really good point, Mark. I was just thinking about what he was saying about the symmetry between open dialogue and anthropology. Um, and sort of I'm thinking how I would, comparing in a way, how I would approach a network meeting versus how I would approach something as, as an anthropologist. And I guess with both, you go in with this attitude of deep listening and trying to learn from somebody else. Um, you're not, you're trying not to be the expert, but you're trying to, and you're not going in with an agenda. You're not going in with any sort of hypotheses um, like you might do in some other academic subjects, academic disciplines, but you're going in and you're really looking at what's emerging and you're building on what people are telling you. And then you might think of a follow-up question. And um, but I'm also just thinking about um, the word Paulism comes to mind as well, um, where we, in open dialogue, we see the person not in terms of individual pathology, but in terms of in a, through a relational approach. Um, and as I'm sure most people might know, Gregory Bateson, um, the famous anthropologist, who is quite influential in the field of family therapy as well, and which which is inspiration for open dialogue in some ways. Um, and he definitely advocated for looking beyond the individual mind and but putting that mind in, in its co entire context. So in some, there are some points during my field work where I don't know whether I'm being an open dialogue practitioner or an anthropologist because they're quite symmetrical, but then it's, it, it is important to step back as well, have some maybe some breaks from the field and then really step out, zoom out and apply a more analytical or interpretive framework to what's happening. I'm aware Lauren hasn't spoken yet, uh, but also Louise has come back. So. Sorry, we were wondering if this might be a good time to invite reflect reflections, but Lauren, did you have something on your? Um, just, yeah, briefly to that, to that theme, um, this symmetry, or I think I've often called it a, a slipperiness <clears throat> between the dialogic and the ethnographic was one of the, one of the great challenges of my field work. Um, and I think the important thing to remember is that part of what is useful and sort of unique about ethnographic research is this, this oscillation that Chiari started to describe that, yes, the experience near is incredibly powerful and it's incredibly important, but the, the receipt from the field, the moving out, the taking the longer view and the dynamic between those two movements, that's where, at least in my own understanding and experience, the generative potential of the methodology lies. So, thinking about how that, how do we extend this sort of symmetry or this slipperiness or this synergy or the way we compare this to sort of a dialogic experience, where do we have that component um, in those forms of understanding? Um, yeah, that's it. Polly, I think that there could be more conversation between you all about that. Any, anybody burning to say something in response to Lauren's? words before we go to reflecting. Can I just say one, one, one thing um, quickly? Because I, I, I completely understand this idea of slipperiness and what Kiara was saying about not knowing quite where you stand. But I suppose one thing I've learned, and this is perhaps as a, as an, as a, a many decades long anthropologist, but a relatively recent um, uh, open dialogue practitioner, is what I've had to unlearn as we know what professional psychiatrists and people in mental health care have to unlearn, but as an anthropologist, I've had to unlearn things in order to be an open dialogue practitioner. I've had to unlearn an interpretive stance, and I've had to learn um, a capacity to be present and to attune and to, I think it's maybe Yaku Sekula who talks about 
listening to what people say, not what they mean. And, and to hold back on that interpretive position that is really quite natural for an anthropologist as an ethnographer, and yet to then occupy a different space, which is the space of reflective meaning, uh, making and, and, and interpretation, that stepping back, as, as Lauren says. So it's almost like I've learned the difference and that difference I think is also important. A beautiful segue to the reflecting team. Thank you, David. Wonderful observation. So if the reflecting team could turn your panels on and then the panelists could turn their panels off. Thank you, that's great. I'm, we're gonna step back again. Bona, you can start. Uh, okay, okay. I, I would like to start because I'm. It's it's still there's still something uh, on my mind by by what uh, David said said at last. How much we have to unlearn to be able to become a, a an OD practitioner. And, and this is this is something that uh, moves me for a long time uh, uh, because uh, well there's so many mind maps we have so many things uh, that's not easy to forget about or to change and uh, something else that uh, that uh, made me thinking more was what Kiara said about the tribal situation, about that we are all part of tribes, and and that's uh, that's uh, yes. Well, how can the tribes be in a dialogue together? What's, what do we need to be aware that we're that we're all kind of in this this different kind of tribes? To, uh, to learn this, or the, you can call it cultures, or tribes, or groups, or, or and and this is also also something uh, to um, well maybe connected with this with this unlearning and to, uh, to be more open to to listen things uh, as yeah well uh, <laughs> openness as the idea that uh, well we need. We can only be open with map ends, where our where our mind map ends, our ideas. Uh, we well, or we we can agree that uh, we don't know. Yeah, we can agree that we don't know. <laughs> uh, my former um, uh, working place, I, I was uh, uh, around a lot of family therapists and uh, they uh, have brought in this uh, uh, notion of uh, the unknown, unknowing um, uh, that you should, uh, th that is, uh, I think, at the core of unlearning. Uh, the not knowing attitude. And I think uh, anthropologists also uh, might learn from that uh, approach to, as uh, Mark said, um, listen to what is said, not to what is what you think they are meaning. Uh, that is a good um, attitude, I think. Uh, and, and also, uh, well, we are not only listening, we are also, as anthropologists, observing and participating. So it is, this uh, openness is, I think it is something that you have to train to, to um, uh, be better at. Uh, and 
I think there are a lot of uh, similarities uh, between anthropology and um, open dialogue practice. And uh, I think the, this, um, um, both the, uh, what I would call the explorative approach, uh, the openness, but also uh, what uh, Lauren was, um, I think was uh, hinting at the, um, well, um, how to say it? Um, well, uh, anthropolo anthropologists uh, often move out and then start to in interpret it, uh, interpret uh, our data and find and construct meanings. What we maybe could um, also be better at or, or um, be more open to is the um, make interpretation together with our informants, the co-construction of meaning. I think um, there are uh, traditions which are calling um, the narrative method are exploring this kind of uh, meaning production or um, as uh, a scholar, um, not only as, as a ther uh, narrative therapist, but as a scholar, you can also uh, explore this way of um, interpreting the, the data together with informants. To me, the idea of tribes and retribalization resonated a lot. And then while listening to the description of the position of an open dialogue prof um, person or an anthropologist, I kind of, well, felt do it, doing open dialogue myself, I started to feel something like an invitation to be maybe part of or member of the tribe of anthropologists as well, because the, the I like the kind of, they spoke about symmetries. I think about the word of parallel structures or issues and this fluid idea of being part of very different tribes as Chiara spoke about is something I like to think about as well. Thank you all that very um, deep listening and sharing. So now, dear uh, reflecting team, if you would turn off your uh, videos and the panelists come back on. Thank you. This term, the informant, when talking about our work as anthropologists and researchers, it always struck me, but it reminds me of the a part of anthropological work that was uh, commanded by the colonial powers to understand the tribes before going there and conquering them or just extracting whatever they wanted to, or in the context of world wars, that they wanted to understand the culture just to influence it, etc. This is something I, I believe that anthropology is moving away from and wants to embrace like a co-research community being part of that community, feeling what the community really needs, wants. And this is the agenda, if there is any, just to feel the whys and hows and 
be there to help them, not to just be there because you want to publish a paper, you're there because somebody's paying you to listen and, and report back these kind of things. Hopefully, it are just a, a distant memory. So, yeah, this is something at least uh, I keep keep close to my heart when I try to do to the research. Yeah. I, I think I'd like to say that it's not the, the, the problems and the politics of knowledge, having knowledge, claiming knowledge, representing situations and people is not is not a problem of history. It's a problem of now. And I think as, as, as anthropologists, we perhaps um, have always been, but need particularly to think about what it means, particularly when it comes to writing, to representing, to producing knowledge about um, situations, um, what, what, um, what, on what basis and with what uh, claim um, uh, does, does an anthropologist um, write about um, a situation or an experience, and how to make the, that process of knowledge making truly um, collaborative, participative, um, to um, engage and involve and allow the many different voices that are involved to make anthropology itself um, polyphonous. And I think that's another thing that we can learn as anthropology moves forward, learn from um, principles of open, of open dialogue. Um, we, we're having a, 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 an interesting experiment in our own work that uh, Chiara mentioned, where we work as a team that brings into that team different positions, people with lived experience of the mental health care people, um, uh, including myself, who've been been carers, and um, of people who've uh, uh, suffered um, um, uh, mental health crises, um, and um, psychiatrists, uh, psychologists, um, and and how we can work with many different voices and and be alongside and with. Um, those who are our participants, who are receiving and are um, a, a part of the the at the, the centre of the, those at the centre of concern uh, with open dialogue. I, I think it's a it's, it's it's a question that one should never stop asking: um, where power lies in the process of knowledge making. No, I wanted to say thank you to the reflecting team for those wonderful insights. Um, I was thinking about Werner's comment about how can the tribes be in dialogue together? Um, and that got me thinking about what tribe I felt most a part of out of the very many hats I wear. And I just kept coming back to, well, I definitely wear towards my, my peer identity the most. And that is the tribe I feel the most belonging to, and on top of which all my other identities pile up, I suppose. Um, and then I was thinking about Onan's comment uh, about the not having a, how to cultivate this not knowing attitude and how as, as researchers, we're so interpretively switched on that it's difficult to switch off that side. And then in a way I was thinking, I'm quite fortunate that I started um, learning of learning to practice open dialogue and learning anthropology around the same time. So in some ways there's been less unlearning that than an experienced uh, anthropologist like David was talking about those those levels of you know that that unlearning process he, he had to undergo. But I was also thinking in network meetings, um, because I have no professional identity to, to fall back on. Initially, I felt quite insecure about that. Oh, I've just got just my, my lived experience. I don't have 
a professional identity to offer interpretations or or any other kind of expertise. Um, and initially, I was a bit insecure about that. But over time, I realized that it 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 made it a lot easier to have that not knowing approach because you're just you go into a network meeting, you're just meeting people where they're at, and they're sitting in the seat that you've been a number of years ago, and 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 that's kind of all I'm bringing, but it's it's kind of a different stance, I guess. Yeah, I think I, I want to pick up on that uh, about not only not knowing, but it's no longer about knowing. Open dialogue isn't an intellectual in, endeavor. I, I think as a, as a trainer, one of the, one of the things I think is 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 most difficult to to communicate is is that unlearning process you're talking about, David, where you go from the interpretive, analytical, um, uh, intellectual stance to a personal, embodied, emotional stance. And most people have been running from that for most of their lives and saying, no, actually that's your resource. That's, that's the fundament upon what you, all the help that you offer will rest on that, on that fundament. And so encouraging people to develop a mindfulness practice uh, um, uh, a mindful movement practice, it's yoga or tai chi or something else, to reacquaint themselves with their bodies, to, to, to allow themselves um, to feel and reflect on um, their own suffering, their own pain, their own discomfort, and be able to use that therapeutically. I don't think that's done very much. And so this kind of radical humility that we try and bring in um, into the training, I, I, I think is, is fundamental. And I think it's probably what keeps many practitioners away from open dialogue because they just don't want to go there because they have their own traumas because they are also only human um and and and, and that can be a scary place to be sometimes and so i think open dialogue creating this community is is is, is essentially is as simple as as just allowing our humanity um to come out within ourselves and and sharing that with others Mm. So I'm, my mind has sort of drifted into a slightly different direction. I mean, not to change the subject, but these, the humanist and existential ideas, the openness, the unknowing, you know, I've been in this a while. I'm a, I'm a big fan of all of that. Um, but I think we are, I'm starting to feel as if we've, we're ignoring the material realities that also play such a big part in this discussion. Um, what are the material and structural and institutional conditions that give someone the opportunity to sit with their trauma in an unknowing kind of way? Um, because those things, when we talk about, you know, where is power located, we can think about it in the, the research relationship, of course, but not everyone is offered the same possibilities for that kind of sitting. Um, and I think that that's just an important, a question that's kind of always in the back of my mind or the forefront of my mind, but something that was coming up for me as we talk about these other really positive features, how do we grapple with this? Yeah, thanks, Lauren. And I'm, I'm not sure how we do it, but, but I think they have to be integrated. Uh, I, 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 I think the, the power threat meeting framework is a way that we can talk about experientially near power, but we can also talk about the social determinants. We can talk about historical trauma. We can talk about structural trauma and structural violence and how that has impacted um, a person's life. And I know Joe Bartholomew is in the chat is asking a lot about peers. And I think peers and peer supported open dialogue is potentially one of the most important uh, developments of open dialogue is, is, is the importance of involving peers at every level um, of, of, of mental health care. Um, and we've talked about open dialogue as a human rights based perspective. 
And so in, in, uh, in, our, in our training, we, we say it's to be an open dialogue practitioner within the current system, you also need to be an activist. Um, and, and that creates also some, some interesting um, discussions because just as Gregory Bateson said, we cannot not communicate, we cannot not be political. Everything we do is political. And so it becomes, politics becomes part of the discussion um, within the open dialogue training, which I think is, is really important. Um, thank you, thank you, Mark, and, and, and Lauren, too, for raising this question of, of power um, and structural constraints and the material conditions under which um, the practice of open dialogue that we're involved in um, takes place. Um, and I think one, one thing that I'm <coughs> often asking <coughs> myself is what what are the conditions of, of dialogue? What are the conditions of dialogue when, what, what, what's the power necessary to be able to speak? Um, what are the conditions under which somebody simply cannot come into dialogue? Because the experience of trauma, the experience of, of loss, the experiences have been so deep that, 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 that dialogue is just not possible. Um, it's it's not possible to to have those to to put into words at this point. It may become so, but um, and thinking about what are the limits of of how how we might work with people who are radically um, disem, disempowered, and and I think one of the useful concepts that we have from anthropology is the idea that some of these wider societal structures um, are actually are actually manifest in in our in in our bodies in people's bodies the idea of the habitus the structural constraints that actually inhabit and shape the uh the the comportment the performance the the the, the stance the ability and manner of speech and whether speech at all is possible um so i think that the structural is also the intimate um, it doesn't mean it's not also the wider societal and the political and things that we engage with outside, but I think those structural relations are also present in the different capacities that, that, that people have to have uh, the power to dialogue or the lack of the power to do so. This be a good time to go back to the reflectors. That be okay? A little bit of nothing. So, so, thank you. Well, I, I would like to say uh, I something in me uh, kind of woke up when when Mark started to talk about uh, uh, bringing in the body. But uh, uh, yes, uh, that it's not what it, the dialogue is. Our being with other people for me. This is this is something I. I thought, yes, this is uh, not to forget that it's it's not about words, but it's about our being with others, uh, and we're in a constant dialogue. Uh, so uh, that's that's an important part, and to be to realize this uh, is uh, well has been an important step for uh, step for me. Uh, w one more thing, uh, I, I can't uh, uh, leave the topic of tribe. And I was thinking even more uh, about the idea what uh, it's not, we're not just part of tribes, but we are all, also part of churches. And uh, when, when, when uh, 
on and uh, talked about that his research is about dialogue between religions. Uh, I was thinking, huh, uh, are we all kind part of uh, different churches, Church of Science, Church of Open Dialogue, Church of other uh, things? And shouldn't we be very, very careful uh, thinking about this and having in mind uh, to, <laughs> to stay open for the dialogue between all these religions? Thank you. Um. I think, um, well, um, there was uh, a lot of arguments or, or reflections about power and power relations from all the participants. And uh, it made me think of, um, well, my inspiration um, theoretically uh, from anthropology, uh, uh, well, at least one um, important uh, tradition is uh, political anthropology uh, in um, in Africa, uh, done by social anthropologists in the Manchester School in in England in 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 UK. Sorry, and they um, they were studying uh, political alliances, and from this, these studies uh, uh, developed theories about uh, social networks, uh, which was um, a, a bridge from former anthropology paying too much, perhaps, weight on the kinship structures. So, um, well, uh, I, I don't know where um, this will lead me now, but. Uh, um, I think um, power uh, and the um, um, asymmetric relations both between uh, different tribes negotiating and between participants in networks meetings are um, important to um, understand better and um, the, the, this is challenging in many ways. What I, I believe is um, a step uh, um, further is to try to integrate these uh, rip, um, power relations within the network meeting uh, and force them to accept the rules of the network meeting and open dialogue. And, and then maybe things can be um, more clear or um, and also be um, transformed in some way. That was what I was thinking of. Um, uh, I, I, um, okay, I, I think I just stopped there. <laughs> I'm wondering about what Mark mentioned about everything we do is political. And then I thought about what could be consequences concerning the implementation of open dialogue. And I was glad that Lauren pointed to just very shortly, but very decisively in my ears to many constraints, structural, and I missed the word uh, still uh, economic constraints, but I think there are so many challenging um, circumstances which do not, which are not really inviting in many situations to implement open dialogue. And though it's very important to, to think about the, the power imbalances within network meetings, I think I, I was um, touched by, by Lawrence hint to look 
towards the outer circumstances and the, the wider context. Shall we head back into the panel? Thank you. Thank you, dear reflectors. I'm not sure where to go with this. Um, but just to put it out, one of the reasons I'm so fascinated um, by open dialogue is that there's something so fundamental about it that it becomes relevant for me as a father and as a partner, uh, as a professional, and also as a citizen. And so we think about the at least 2,500 year old history of, of dialogues. Um, and Kermit uh, kind of presented um, uh, this, this town hall as, as, as when, when, when people and communities and nation states uh, experience tensions and conflict and, and, and how is that resolved? And very often the, the optimal form of resolution is through dialogue. And so there is this hope that if we can implement open society, open communication, dialogical, deliberative democracy, if we can use the skills that we try to cultivate within open dialogue, can we not create more compassionate, peaceful, caring communities? Um, and so I don't spend my time studying an intervention or a technique, but as Yako Saikala wrote, as, as a way of being. Um, and I know that's a huge challenge for a lot of people, but I think for me, it's always been an essential part of open dialogue that, it, that it, in, the, in the last instance, it, it comes down to, uh, to dialogue as the embodiment of love and dialogue as, as a way of being. I realized I've been quite quiet when it came to the topic of power. And I think it's because I just, I don't really know where to start. Um, I'm definitely an optimist. So I, I started all of this work feeling so sort of drawn into open dialogue. Um, and then you hit a few roadblocks around along the way. And there've definitely been points where I have felt um, I'm seeing more in terms of my my peer badge, and because of that, I've, there's definitely been points where I've been, I felt underestimated, or sort of institutionally been seen as not as responsible, or pushed around a little bit. Sometimes, once asked, questioned more about my, per, you know, per, perceptions of my investment in clients, um, which I sort of think maybe other people with other professional identities may not be questioned on, on, on along those lines. Um, I've been, you know, it was suggested that I, I needed training to offer peer, peer support training to offer peer support and so on. So there have definitely been points where I have cried <laughs> during my field work here <laughs> and it has been because of power struggles, but at the end of the day, the, the battles are totally worth it. 
um i've just i've loved the, the clients that i've met i've learned so much from them and just through this experience and just being able to see how much open dialogue does help uh, makes it very worth it and i think something you were saying mark about the impact of the the training and it it really has made me it's it has really transformed me in terms of my my personal relationships with people as well it's made me a lot braver in terms of having difficult conversations with people or actually yeah just being more open to that like taking some positive risks and communicating those and yeah so that's just a bit of a, a personal anecdote maybe too personal but i'll leave it there Um, well, my, my route into open dialogue was also personal, and I certainly, uh, what Mark said and what Chiara said about open dialogue as, as something quite embracing and tra potentially transforming and uh, a way of being um, resonates with me. But I'm also got in mind that I'm struck by the point that um, Werner made about um, tribes and churches and whether and whether and with what consequences open dialogue becomes a tribe or becomes a church um, with its own prophets and priests and high priests and uh, and hierarchies and novitiates and uh, and ceremonies and rituals. And I'm thinking about also the question about dialogue and how we, if, what are the, how do we, how do we prevent open dialogue being a church in the institutionalized sense of a, of a sectarianism in which its practitioners may be um, bounded off from other tribes, whether it's systemic family therapists or whether it's uh, clinical psychiatrists or whether it produces as a tribe a kind of oppositional logic where it is, we are not they. And we have the whiz, we have it. We, we, we're carriers of, um, of the truth and, and, and they, they are the, the, they live in darkness and we live in light. And, and how do we, how do we, prevent um, the, the kind of the tribalization in, in that negative sense so, so that we can return and enable Doug to be what, what Mark and, and I think Chiara is also suggesting is it's, it isn't something that is contained in a, in a sort of exclusive way and yet at the same time to hold fast to what are clearly necessary ways of working which are challenging and if if not if not in some sense um, if in some sense there isn't a gospel of open dialogue then it will just disperse and dilute and and and, and disappear. So I see that as a I see that as a tension how to be how to be distinctive and important without being a cult um, in and, and without provoking resistance and pushback from the institutions and the systems within which open dialogue has ultimately to find its place if it's going to transform uh, mental health care systems on a larger scale. I want to say thank you, David, for articulating that as well as you did, I think you helped me understand what some of my own discomforts with this word tribe actually have been over the last hour. Um, because I think, you know, on one hand, you know, Enrique mentioned earlier sort of the, the reparative aims of a post-colonial kind of anthropology, 
the the word tribe actually brings a lot of problematic connotations to mind for me ideas of romanticism and otherness and and i wasn't really sure where to put those feelings um but i think david you made some really um useful insights and you said them very well so thank you for helping clarify my thinking around that point So I, I guess uh, um, at the risk of being a disciple, um, I, I, I do believe that there are values, perspectives, um, tendencies that are more open and sustainable. So how do we how do we resist the solidification, the reification of, of open dialogue? By by cultivating those values that are already intrinsic to open dialogue. So that sense of radical humility, um, that sense of unfinalizability that Bakhtin talked about, the sense of heteroglossia, the, the, the multiplicity of meanings, this the 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 continual reminder of what I'm presenting is only my unique, historicized, socialized perspective, which is, is extremely limited. Uh, and so I can't know what it's like for you to be you, and I would never pretend to be that. And so, again, thinking about how can we create um, these small scale communities that people live in every day and suffer uh, and struggle to recover uh, within. How do we help those small communities, but how do we also help those larger communities um, create safe spaces for those people? Um, and, and, and for me, at least, open dialogue has given me some hope that um, there are values um, and perspectives um, uh, and abilities that I can cultivate that, that potentially um, can help not only myself, but the people that I dialogue with every day. And I, and I think that's what gives me, gives me hope that um, open dialogue is worth, worth fighting for to a certain extent. Hey, we're hopping back in um, and thinking, I picked up Catherine Quinlan saying, we all need a week long retreat together. Um, definitely in, in the East where I come from or the States, they talk about pemmican as something that indigenous people made out of deer meat and berries and you have to chew it for a long time. And this has been very pemmican like for me, this conversation. Um, I. We have just about five minutes left and I'd love to invite um, your last thoughts. There are lots of wonderful questions. I'm sorry that we didn't include them, but there've been a lot of conversations back and forth on the chat about questions. Um, but I'd love to just have, can you look that? Could, um, I'd love to have last thoughts from you. Dear participants, dear panelists, and participants in the chat as well. I'm, I'm thinking of David saying open dialogue has gifted me some hope, and I'm left with, with that thought.
I have many things on my mind and I'm not sure what to um, how, how to articulate but I suppose I suppose the final comment for me is 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 just how for me open dialogue has allowed the building of a bridge between things that are uh, very personal and individual and are about and require um, self-work and self-understanding and self-knowledge um, and self-presence and being with uh, with with others and uh, in that sense I I do feel that I'm really just at the beginning of 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 a of a journey which um, maybe is called open dialogue at the moment but maybe it'll have a different name um, at another at another point and it'll do it'll do different things but I think just to um, just to emphasize for me that um, there are connections and I think connection is another thing we haven't really talked much about the social network approach uh, that open dialogue encourages but it is for me also all about all about connections and making connections that wouldn't otherwise be made um, and, and creating a field of, of living and being which is more connected. I have also many thoughts in mind, but maybe as, you know, with the embracing of a state of unknowing, you know, one of the things I recognize is that my own oscillation between sort of dialogic and ethnographic roles will be ongoing. And it's something that I will negotiate in different contexts at different times with different outcomes and, and I'm happy to continue doing so. Um, and David's point about connection really made me pause and reflect on the people that I have met through this engagement, either with the model itself in different places across the world at this point here in Berlin, where I now live, the connections it has fostered have gone far beyond the research context, far beyond my field work, um, far beyond those sort of categorical limitations. And I'm very appreciative of that um, and, and the role that that has played in, in the life I am building. So. Yeah, a moment of appreciation from my end. I, I guess before we end, I just want to acknowledge all the voices that aren't here. Um, all of you who are sitting across the globe, um, doing work, struggling. <laughs> I noticed someone uh, wrote they'd been a mental health gladiator for 30 years. Um, we're all warriors in that sense. Uh, it is a struggle. There are forces there that are, 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 are working to sustain the status quo and it's not easy, um, but know that you are part of a community um, and thank you for being part of that community. And we, and we do, I, I think what David said, it's, it's, it's about connecting. So, so thank you for connecting with us today. Um, and, and I hope you'll stay connected. Uh, we, there's, a, there's a meeting in May in Tornio, um, and then another meeting in, in Yesenik in the Czech Republic. Um, so for those of you who would like to, to meet and share, um, I do think the changes, the transformation we need within mental health care is a civil rights movement. Uh, uh, and I do think we need to work together um, to change the system. So thank you for everything you're doing wherever you are in the world. And thank you for by, being part of this community. I just wanted to say thank you to Louisa and Kermit for inviting me. Um, I met Louisa over a year ago on Open Dialogue training and she's one special lady. Um, and this conversation feels like, it feels like there's so much more to talk about, but it's been 
really nice to be privy to this. Um, and yeah, thank you, everybody. Yeah, I also want to to thank you, everybody. It's a, it's a good fight, and just keep on going. Yep. It's a good fight, and we're doing it together. Yeah. Arms across the globe, hearts across the globe. The goal is not to find an end to the dialogue, but to always be beginning. Mm -hmm. However, we have come to the end of this one. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody that, that came on to listen and to talk with each other in the chat. And thank you, dear panelists. And the reflecting team, could you come back on, please? And Kathy? Thank you. Yeah, thank you all so much. Do you, any last words from Sabine and Onund and dear Werner and, and Kathy? I feel enriched by so many different thoughts which have been talked about and which encourage me to think in very different directions continue thinking about things. And the experience, again, the experience of feeling connected all around the globe is very enriching as well. So thank you. I feel very um, um, inspired by this uh, conversation and I don't have these kind of conversations very often, sadly. So I'm very pleased to be uh, invited to this. And um, I, I want to say that I think this, um, and I know that this uh, dialogical approach is useful and necessary in other fields as well, not only mental health field. So uh, in the peace uh, processes, uh, and also in uh, societies where people are, uh, in fact, uh, feeling uh, belonging to different tribes. There are polarization in, in the society, and religion is, has a lot, of, a lot to do with this uh, now, sadly enough. So uh, I think uh, other fields can learn from the mental health field and from the experiences with open dialogue in mental health. And that is what I'm very um, uh, concerned with uh, right now. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm, 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 there's something in me in the rhythm uh, of a, a, with a drum repeating connection, its connection. <laughs> this, this is something that resonates with me now uh, uh, again and again because this is uh, so crucial for me connection thank you Kathy do you do you have something on your heart you'd like to say before we close Just a, a deep gratitude for being part of this and uh, and all these connections. So thank you. Mm, thank you. We invited Rafaela on, but she hasn't popped on. But Rafaela, thank you too for being on with us and for all that you um, have done in the last little bit to bring us together as well. And uh, thank you all, everybody, everywhere.